That is Putin's illegal annexation party. They're celebrating annexing four territories that Ukraine partly controls and is on the verge of further liberating. Half of the room are against annexation, which shows the deep rot of the Russian state. And this is the open-air Kremlin party. Politics turned into aesthetics, a fascist signature. But don't confuse this with real political mobilization. Here are the buses that brought these people in. So what's the actual meaning of the event they're celebrating? For Russia, it could mean the destruction of the Russian state, civil war and economic collapse. For the world and for Ukraine, it means unacceptably high risk of nuclear war. Following my recent mobilization video and many Q&As on the second channel, I received hundreds of questions about this. I've selected 18 of the most fundamental questions. Let's blitz through them and try to give them transformational answers. How sincere was Putin's insane annexation speech? It was disturbingly sincere and it was not about Ukraine, not about NATO, but about the evil and corrupt West that must be defeated, which is assailing Russia from all corners. And I want to take you into that speech, not by quoting it, but actually sharing with you a very well-made paraphrase of the key bits of the speech that got put on Twitter by Konstantin Kissin, who knows Russian language and Russian politics well. Let's go. It is this avarice and desire to preserve its power that is the reason for the hybrid war the collective West is waging on Russia. They want us to be a colony, a mob of soulless slaves, that I quote. The rules-based order the West goes on about is nonsense. Who made these rules? Who agreed to them? Russia is an ancient country and civilization, and we will not play by these rigged rules. The West has no moral authority to challenge the referenda because it has violated the borders of other countries. Western elites are totalitarian, despotic, apartheidistic. Direct quote. They are racist against Russia and other countries and nations. Russophobia is racism. They discriminate by calling themselves the civilized world. This is all paraphrases of Putin. They colonized, started the global slave trade, genocided Native Americans, pillaged India and Africa, forced China to buy opium through war. We, on the other hand, are proud that we have led the anti-colonial movements that helped countries develop to reduce poverty and inequality. They are Russophobic. They hate us because we didn't allow our country to be pillaged. They have been trying to destabilize our country since the 17th century, which is the beginning of the Romanov dynasty. Eventually they managed to get their hands on us because Gorbachev, bad, bad Gorbachev, luckily is that at the end of the 20th century. We remember this. We won't forget it. The West claims to bring freedom and democracy to other countries, but it's the exact opposite of the truth. The unipolar world is anti-democratic by its very nature. It is a lie. They use nuclear weapons, creating a precedent oh yes oh yes they flattened german cities without any military need to do so there was no need for this except to scare us and the rest of the world korea vietnam to this day they occupy japan south korea and germany and other countries are cynically calling them allies the u.s rules the world by the power of the fist their neo-colonialism is cloaked in lies like containment of Russia, China, and Iran. The concept of truth has been <laughs> destroyed with fakes and extreme propaganda. Constantine says irony game is strong. They solved the problems of the 20th century with World War I, and the US established dominance of the world via the dollar as a result of World War II. In the 80s, they had another crisis they solved by plundering country and Gorbachev he did it and luckily he's dead now now they want to solve their problems by breaking Russia there is more they're, they're crazy I want to speak to all Russian citizens do we want to replace mom and dad with parent one and two they invented genders and they claim you can transition do we want this for our children we have a different vision they have abandoned religion and embraced Satanism. Direct quote. We have many like-minded friends in Western countries. We see and appreciate their support. They are forming liberation anti-colonial movements as we speak. Direct quote. This will only grow. This is a key part of Putin's strategy. The breaking of the West hegemony is inevitable. Mommy, I don't like the past or the present or the future. I don't like reality. Mommy, you can save me now. Now I'm only small. 
Sorry, that wasn't actually in the speech. But let's take this seriously. How sincere is it? It's 85% sincere. The only bit there where Putin is transparently lying is the gender stuff. In other words, that's just political technology. He is not genuinely worked up about that. And just think of the extraordinary conspiracy thinking in that. What surrounds Putin isn't some kind of Anglo-Saxon conspiracy all around Russia's borders and out to get him. What surrounds him is, first of all, reality. Reality in all of its complex and marvelous and hypocritical and very dark forms. And what else surrounds him? The future. And the perception that younger generation Russians want to see Putin's vision of the world die with him. But there is something even more important to say here about Putin's sense of assailment, which brings out the fact that his extraordinary, aggressive and brutal war against Ukraine is in his mind a defensive war. How could that be possibly true? In his mind, it is. And it goes like this. There will be a revolutionary moment in Russia where his leadership is in peril. And even if it doesn't happen to him, it'll happen to his successor, he thinks. At that moment, Ukraine cannot be a democratic and independent country on Russia's borders. Forget NATO, forget any membership of Western alliances. Just a democratic Ukraine is an existential threat because at that revolutionary moment, it will symbolically and practically contribute to the pro-democratic revolutionary forces. And that means that the very existence of democratic and independent Ukraine is perceived by Putin as a threat to his rule, as a threat to his life, and being a threat to his rule and a threat to his life, it is a threat in his mind to Russian civilization. How does annexation impact nuclear risk to the world? Unlike mobilization, and even unlike the brutal war that Putin started in February, annexation is an irreversible step. And it's so in three ways. First, Putin's capacity to justify using nuclear weapons to himself changes with this illegal relabeling of Ukrainian territory as Russia. Putin, even in this speech that we heard, is really talking and arguing with himself. He is trying to persuade himself of stuff. And what's tragic is that the world is hostage now to policy that is really a product of extraordinary pers <coughs> personalized power that's basically making that policy a product of the inner conflicts of a particularly deranged individual who overstayed badly in power. Second thing it changes is Putin's capacity to justify through the Russian political system, insofar as it exists, the use of nuclear weapons, because now he'd be talking about defending Russian territory. And the third consequence is that Putin irreversibly increases the risk of runaway global escalation. There is a temptation to think, what would we do if they did this? And what would they do if we did this? And then see each of these decisions as an individual of a piece with itself call that's being made. But in fact, it'll be part of a slide of escalation that always risks getting out of control. These are not individual decisions. And when patterns of escalation develop, you see states doing tomorrow things they thought they would never do today. How has propaganda changed since mobilization and annexation? The first change is that propaganda is now focused on a civilizational existential fight with the West. And Ukraine has disappeared from the headlines. We talked about this and predicted it in February and March, as did all of the most insightful Russia commentators. The second change is that for the first time ever under Putin, propaganda has begun to fail and splutter on the particular issue of mobilization. Now, normally Russian propaganda works by saturating the informational environment with incompatible messages that don't persuade, but confuse and depoliticize the viewer. Normally it works, but the effect of that approach with mobilization has been that the viewer has seen four, five different messages per week from the same propagandist on the issue of mobilization 
and they haven't been depoliticized by these messages. Instead, they've heard them as, you're going to die, you're not going to die, you're going to die, you're not going to die, you're going to die, you're not going to die, depending on how much they blew up or played down the issue of mobilization. And on this issue, Russian propaganda is currently spluttering and no longer working. If we had a magical lie detector test and asked Putin what he wants the most, what his bottom lines are, what would he say? To defeat the West and to avoid losing himself. And these are not bottom lines, they are fixations. And he feels that he must do everything in his power to avoid these outcomes. What is victory for Putin? The annexations being followed by a negotiation with some concessions to Russia and then capturing Kiev four years, eight years later. Short of that, he at least wants to protract the conflict and wait until the West becomes more apathetic and divided over Ukraine. Is Putin bluffing about the use of nuclear weapons? If by bluff you mean a 100% bluff, such that he has privately made a decision to not use nuclear weapons, but is publicly threatening to use them, then that's not the case. In other words, no insightful and long-time observer of Russia could possibly entertain that thought as a serious possibility. So he's open to using nuclear weapons. But to what extent? And there's a two-part thought here that's really important to bear in mind that Putin has been sharing with the world for years. The first part he shares explicitly, and that part goes like this. What is the point for the world to exist unless there's Russia in it? So here's him saying it. А зачем нам такой мир, если там не будет России? The second part of that thought is I am Russia. Putin is Russia in his mind. And that has been implicitly expressed by Putin in many of his civilizational speeches since about 2012 when he took this civilizational turn and started to think of himself as engaged in an existential war against the West. And Volodin, the uh, guy presiding over the Russian Duma, has indeed said that Putin is Russia and that without Putin, Russia wouldn't exist. How would Russians feel about a nuclear attack on Ukraine? Actually, not very well at all. And you might be surprised by that, given the extraordinary brutality and genocidal antics of the Russian military in Ukraine that the Russian population seems to have absorbed to some degree. So what is going on here? Well, something really important needs to be put on the table. This is not an ordinary colonial enterprise that the Russians are engaged in. As far as Putin's delusions and the propaganda machine go, Ukrainians are not ethnically inferior people to Russians who need to be colonized and civilized. Rather, they are non-existent. That's to say Ukrainians are just Russians who have forgotten that they're Russian and are in denial of their true identity and are betraying Russia. This is the Putin propaganda story by going away and being cuddly with the West. So this is not an inferior group being colonized and civilized. These are our people who have betrayed us, according to Putin and according to the propaganda machine. And I actually think that because of that, there will be a kind of shift whereby they'll be incomparably more shocked by a nuclear attack on Ukraine than they would be by a nuclear attack on the Baltics. But how would the Russian propaganda machine justify this, if, God forbid, this ever happened? It would say we had to bomb our own territory because the evil West was coming to get us. When will blowback come after mobilization? It's very important that despite the protests and despite the incinerated conscription centers, the real blowback is going to come at this time, a time when mobilization has happened and has been perceived by that 50 to 65 percent, that's the passive bit of the Russian population, as having failed to achieve any significant results in the war. So the real blowback will come not when mobilization has happened to a very significant degree, but when it's happened, 
failed and seen to have failed by many Russians. What if Putin dies? Well, that's an interesting question. If we go back to our thought that half of the people in that joyous room didn't actually agree with the annexation. We can also speculate, as I speculate, that not a single person in Putin's Security Council would have started a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. It's rather that it's been started now and should be finished, is their thought. But their thought is not in February 23, 24, we should start a full-scale invasion. They would have wanted to do something, but not that. So that's quite interesting. And then look, we've got to look at a model like the death of Stalin. All the people around Stalin were supporting him. But as soon as he died, within weeks and months, they were engaged in policies completely incompatible with his. So if Putin dies, what would be the chances that Russia would be extremely keen to stop this war as soon as possible, even on unfavorable terms to Russia? Pretty good. Pretty reasonable. We can't be certain of that, but that's a quite a good expectation because so much of what's happening now is a product of Putin's romantic capital R isolation. Who is that guy? That's Magomed Salam Magomedalevich Magomedov, who is the deputy chief of staff of Putin's presidential administration. A lot of people that uh, a lot of us don't even know at that um, uh, Hague waiting, <coughs> sorry, gathering, gathering to celebrate the um, uh, illegal annexation. Does Russia know what it is fighting for? If you mean the Russian people, then no, they don't know what they're fighting for and they don't know in two really important ways. Now the Russian people are 50 to 65 percent depoliticized, 15 to 25 percent pro-war positively and 20 to 25 percent positively against the war. Put aside the people who are against the war, look at the ones that are left, they don't know in two important ways what's going on in Ukraine. First of all, specifically the Ukraine war story that the regime shares keep changing, keeps changing every few weeks. And then the broader ideological justifications can come from people like Alexander Dugin, and these are in equal measure silly, obscure, laughable, um, and unreal. So that's one sense, but there is an even more important sense in which Russians don't know what they're fighting for. And that's that there is no larger imperial project that gives context to what's happening in Ukraine. Think about it. Empires impose a kind of imperial standard, which might be despicable or racist or ugly or brutal or cruel, but they impose a kind of standard that might be to do with certain kinds of values or certain ideas about modernization. They impose it on a population, on a territory. Russia doesn't have anything like that. It's not offering anything. It's not offering any kind of civilizational vision, any kind of standard. It's zilch. It's empty. It's a kind of a postmodern empty box, right? And what's offered is death and violence. But even cruel and brutal empires offer more than that. So the correct diagnosis is Russia fake empire, fake collapsing empire. Can Ukraine lose? If we mean by lose Russia gaining ideological control over Ukraine, Ukraine can't lose, and it even couldn't lose if we stopped arming Ukraine and started arming Russia. There is no way Ukrainians would tolerate being under Moscow's ideological control. That train is gone, it's gone today, and it's gonna be gone 50 years from now. Luckiest scenario for Putin, question mark? The war freezes, unfreezes, freezes, unfreezes, goes on, goes on, goes on, goes on. And then a few years down the line, when the war is still going on, Viktor Orban style politicians come to power in North America and Western Europe. And Russia, without changing much, gets reintroduced by these politicians into the globalized world. Not a zero chance of that happening, actually. It's higher than zero. Why did Putin delay that speech overnight about mobilization? This is important because there is room for speculation that I had, and also Pastuchov, an important Russian commentator, had, which is that Putin was possibly, this is pure speculation, doing several things, one of which 
was finessing the nuclear threats in the speech. Why? Because nuclear threats are central to Russian foreign policy. They're the main tool of diplomacy or foreign policy available to Russia. And I predict that will continue as long as that regime persists. If that regime persists, the only way that will cease to be the main tool if Putin judges that threats of the use of nuclear weapons become less effective than the actual use of nuclear weapons. How will the Putin regime collapse? The Putin regime will collapse in one of two ways. It will go through a wobble and in the middle of that wobble it will be rocked by somebody coming in, metaphorically somebody, and delivering a knockout blow. And that somebody could be a combination of elite maneuvers as well as public protest. Public protest can get activated as an important political tool at that moment when the regime wobbles. So that's one scenario, when the regime is wobbling. The second scenario is when the regime expires. And that's quite different. That's when the regime simply and gradually reaches a stage where signals don't go through, when decisions don't go through, when the regime reaches the sort of stage the Soviet Union reached at the very end, when governance was sort of like turning the wheel, but then nothing happening. And at that point, you wouldn't even need protest because you're going to be walking through an open door. There's then a third way in which you can get rid of an autocratic regime, but that doesn't apply to Russia. And that's getting rid of it in its very, very early stages. You can do that. And Ukraine did that in a sense in 2014. Could 100,000 Russians march on the Kremlin? Well, I think two things need to be said here. The first is that for protest to happen, you need to have a lot of people with the perception that it can make a difference. And for that, you need two things. You need a wobble on the part of the regime which could happen soon, but isn't happening right now, combined with possibly a leader or a set of leaders who say, we are now at point A, we need to get to point B, and protest is one of our tools about how we go from A to B. And if that scenario obtains, you will actually see Russians protesting and even Russians being willing to lay, lay their lives down for regime change or even to stop the war in Ukraine. And the second thing that needs to be said here is that the way the regime is responding to protests, except for some of the mobilization protests, which were responded to with concessions, particularly in Dagestan, but the way the regime responds to anti-regime protests is so harsh that it's creating a situation where, in a sort of basic game theoretical sense, it's not clear that peaceful protest is any less dangerous than violent protest. And that might affect the sort of protest we see in Russia in the future. I mean, just to put it in context, let's create a hypothetical, realistic worst case scenario for going out to protest and things going badly. You're out. There's not a very big group of people protesting. Let's say it happens tomorrow. You get away. You go home, but you are spotted on the camera and at five in the morning the next day there's an axe through the door and six people in balaclavas come in. They take you, all of your devices, all of your files, and they take you to a police station where you might be given access to a quick phone call with a lawyer, which will be futile. Then you'll be moved to another facility and then you might be asked questions about some correspondence of yours they've found. And then you might have a broom stuck up your bum. And then you might be put in prison. And then you might be sentenced to six and a half years. And then on top of that, they might find three people in your life via all the files they took. And they might not imprison them, but they might freeze their bank accounts, make sure they lose their jobs if they work for the state, and make them unable to leave the country. And that sort of thing begins to change people's calculation about mode of protest. How are Russians reacting to annexation? They're not. They're not reacting at all. The organic reaction you saw to Crimea isn't happening at all. Russians are 
agitated about mobilization, still not properly politically awake to the true ramifications of the brutal invasion of Ukraine and the true nature of the totalitarian developments in their country. But they're not reacting to the annexation really at all. If you look at that 50 to 65 percent of the population, um, there's basically nothing there except the slight perception there's something fishy about this, but maybe not so fishy that we need to look at it too much and anyway looking at it too much might be dangerous. Does mobilization and annexation satisfy Z patriots like Dugin and Girkin? No, nothing satisfies them because they want total war, total conquest of Ukraine, the economy put on a total war footing. But what's really important to understand about them is that they're not in pursuit of autonomous political aspirations. You see, they still want Putin to do the ruling. They just want him to do it differently. So think of them like football supporters who hate the players on their team, but don't imagine themselves getting onto the pitch. They influence the situation via swishing around and impacting public opinion, which in turn impacts the regime. And this takes us to the fundamental deal Putin has with his people. They outsource politics to him. In exchange, he stays out of their lives. That deal has recently begun to break. And that's going to have significant ramifications for Putin's hold over power. And to learn more about that, watch this video next.